Hello, welcome to 8th grade social studies star test prep. This is the last in the seven minute mastery series. This is a two part session. This will be longer than your other ones. This will probably be the last video you watch before you prepare, get ready to take your star test. As always, it's probably a good idea to have your study guide review out with you, your packet, so that you can mark and make notes in that as we go. So let's get started. Okay, the colonial governments. Self-representative governments were the first types of governments in the colonies. They were necessary to keep order and structure in the colonies because the British government was thousands of miles away and many months away. So being so far from Great Britain made it just more necessary for these early colonists in places like Massachusetts and Virginia. Uh, it made it necessary for them to need their own self-representative governments. Um, some of those first self-representative governments were the Mayflower Compact. That was the, the Pilgrims at Plymouth. The Fundamentals Order, Orders of Connecticut. The Virginia House of Burgesses. By the way, the Virginia House of Burgesses was the very first colonial government. Um, and it ended up really being a model for the colonial governments to follow. By the way, these colonists were technically British citizens. Okay, um, They were subject to the British crown. They weren't seeking their own complete independence from the King of England. They were colonists. They were still subject to the British government, but they were starting their own colonial governments under the, the British crown still, but they were still representing themselves because they were not represented in British Parliament. So to have a colony, one was granted a charter from the king and parliament. Um, a charter, charter was simply a written agreement between the king and the colonists, or somebody who was running a colony. The king would grant them permission to have a certain amount of land in the New World, in the Americas, and then they would go and they would establish this colony. So colonial legislatures were land-owning white men who were elected locally by the colonists while the governor of the colony was usually directly appointed by the king. So the king still had a hand in it, but these colonial legislatures were groups of men elected by the locals. So these often um, were represented in the forms of town meetings. Town meetings were an early example of these locals making decisions. They would just have a town meeting. What do we need to do about this issue or that issue? So Virginia House of Burgesses was the first colonial government, as I said, um, British Parliament. Well, British Parliament was legislators. They were representative of British people, but they weren't representative of American colonists. Okay, let's talk about economics in, in government. So salutary neglect. That is the British government basically saying, colonists, you can do what you want as long as it doesn't disturb our empire. And you see this comic up here on the top right. You see mother country. That would be Great Britain in this case. And she is fat and plump. She has had plenty. She has had more than enough to eat. And the colonists are still bringing her more and more. So as long as the colonists were, were helping out and giving to and contributing to the, the growth of the British Empire, the British government really didn't care what kind of self-governments these colonists had. The, now, this happened because of mercantilism. Mercantilism is the British putting strict limitations through laws and taxes on the American colonies, relegating their trade to only the British. And there were differing laws and limitations on this, but essentially what it was, mercantilism, is the British government saying your only market, so think of that with mercantilism, your only market is us. You must sell goods from us and you must purchase goods from us. You can see that illustration below. And that limited the colony's ability to to expand and to grow economically, but it really helped the British Empire. It helped Great Britain, but it hurt the colonists. So you can see why the colonists were already perturbed about this. So the Proclamation of 1763. This was the end to salutary neglect because the King of England basically began telling the colonists in 1763 where they could and couldn't go and led to the beginning of a wave of new taxes and this was the end of neglecting these colonists. We're going to talk about the Proclamation of 1763 more here in a moment. Religion in government. So Lord Baltimore organized the colony of Maryland. I hope that's easy to remember because we know Baltimore now, the current city of Baltimore, is in Maryland. So Lord Baltimore organized the colony of Maryland in 1633. 
Again, we're not here to memorize dates. It just helps us kind of know the sequence of events. Um, and it really was a safe haven for Catholics. And the way, the way that I remember this, hopefully it'll help you, is Mother Mary is a crucial figure in the Catholic faith. And so I think of Maryland, Maryland as a safe haven for Catholics. Thomas Hooker, on the other hand, he founded the colony of Connecticut in 1636, so just a few short years later. He actually was arguing with the Puritans at Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he left that colony because they were too strict based on his beliefs. And in his colony, Thomas Hooker's colony of Connecticut, he gave the right to vote to citizens of that colony regardless of church membership, which doesn't seem like a big deal. But in the Puritan faith, that was a very big deal because... In Massachusetts, you had to be part of the church first and foremost before you had any say in government. Thomas Hooker began to change that. Well, Roger Williams, a few short years later, he established the colony of Rhode Island in 1644. And, th and, and this is known for the idea of separation of church and state. Again, very similar to Thomas Hooker here. Um, again, unlike the Puritans. So there was a separation of church and state. And really, Rhode Island became a safe haven for Baptists and Jews and other faiths or non-believers uh, different than the Massachusetts colony. So Roger Williams and Thomas Hooker of Connecticut and Rhode Island, I want you to think of these two men as those who begin to change the Puritan system or separate themselves from the Puritan system in these New England colonies, giving more religious freedom. Now, even the Puritans were in the New World for religious freedom, but to be clear, they weren't in it for religious freedom for everyone. They wanted freedom for them and their belief systems. Okay, there were 13 original British colonies at the time of the American Revolution. These colonies had charters from Great Britain, like we already talked about. They were under British rule and had their own representative self-governments. The first colony was Virginia, where the first permanent settlement of Jamestown was. The colonies were formed for various reasons by the individuals and groups that formed them, but they were permitted by the British government for growth, of the empire and financial gain. So the British government was allowing these colonists to go over there because the Great Britain wanted to claim the land, first of all. It's hard to claim land if you don't have people occupying that land. So Great Britain, and just like all the empires of the world at the time, they wanted people on the land they were trying to claim. And that having the British colonies was the way that they went about doing that. Growing the empire. So let's talk about the different sectors of the colonies here. New England was the northernmost of the of the colonial regions, okay? So there's multiple colonies in New England. Colonies like New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. These colonies were often founded for religious freedom, reasons and pursuits led by groups like the Puritans, which were separatists, uh, or the Pilgrims, sorry, which were separatists. The Pilgrims were separating themselves from the Church of England. And Puritans who wanted a more purified form of the Church of England, so they both left England to come to what was eventually known as New England. Hopefully that makes sense now. And they were starting their own religious colonies here. And then we saw like Rhode Island and Connecticut were offshoots of those original colonies trying to find their own form of religious freedom. So what is the New England colonies known for originally? Well, first of all, it's farther north. It's a colder climate. They had rockier soil. There was, so farming wasn't as easy. Um, they did have large, deep harbors and fast-flowing rivers and a lot of forests. So these fast-flowing rivers eventually led to being good rivers for mills and industry and factories later on. But initially, this area was very good for bringing in ships because there was deep harbors where the ships could come close to shore. Um, fishing was abundant and was a, a big point of wealth for a lot of the locals. Also, because of the forests, there was a lot of there was a strong timber industry, and then shipbuilding became a big business here as well. Now, the middle colonies, well, they're more in the middle. Now, some of them are a little bit further north as well, but they're the middle colonies. These include New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. They had a moderate climate. So think about this, middle colonies, more of a middle climate, right? Some cold and some warm. With fertile soil, well, so there was, because of the fertile soil, they could grow a lot of good crops. There wasn't the large plantations of the South because they did have a colder climate and not as quite of long of growing season. But nonetheless, there was lots of wheat and corn grown here, mostly with smaller local farmers. 
Okay, there were some large cities here that, that began to develop, and by large, that's relative. Initially, a large city could have been a couple thousand people, but large cities developed here, New York City and Philadelphia being two of the largest. Initially, Philadelphia was larger, and these were trade. there was a lot of trading and merchants here. Um, there's lots of diversity in the middle colonies, the different, different people groups, religions, agriculture, population sizes, and lifestyles. The one thing to remember is that the middle colonies really were truly kind of middle in a lot of ways between New England in the north and the southern colonies in the south. Speaking of which, the southern colonies, these include Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, all the way down to Georgia. They had a warmer climate because they were further south. They had great soil to grow things, so and they ended up having large plantations, and farming oftentimes led to cash crops. First of all, first and foremost, tobacco and then rice, indigo, and eventually finally cotton became king in the South. Slavery was much larger part of Southern culture because the vast amounts of land owned in cash crop plantations incentivized slavery, making it more financially beneficial for people to own slaves. Now, to be clear, most people didn't own slaves, but a lot more did own slaves here than elsewhere. And oftentimes this was in the tobacco fields, at least at first. By the early, mid-1800s, cotton had taken over, though there was still a lot of tobacco being grown. All right, the colonies were in America, and all were British, but all were very unique and prided themselves in being their own individual colony with their own self-government. So the one thing I want you to remember from this is all these colonists were very unique and individual. They saw themselves as Virginians or New Yorkers. They didn't think of themselves so much as Americans, though they all were still considered British because they were British colonists in America in their colony of, like I said, South Carolina, Virginia, wherever. So the colonists all had individual reasons for being there, but the British government wanted colonial land essentially to expand the British Empire. The more land they could claim, the more colonies they had, they had the bigger their empire, and the more wealth they could gain through things like mercantilism, right? And so the British Empire wanted to gain this wealth, this property, these goods, and influence around the world. That was their reason for doing this. Jamestown was the first permanent British settlement in the New World, as we've said, and it was founded, this is one thing to remember, Jamestown, Virginia was founded in the pursuit of gold. They didn't find any gold. Eventually, they gained their wealth through growing cash crops like tobacco. That's where they gained their wealth, not through gold. But there were some who came not seeking wealth necessarily, but seeking religious freedom. That was the Pilgrims. Jamestown was founded in 1607. The Pilgrims, a few short years later. The Pilgrims at Plymouth Colony later became part of Massachusetts Colony, by the way. But the Pilgrims, they came to establish their own personal freedoms. Now, I told you those freedoms weren't free for everyone, so other colonies began to form to give more liberties and freedoms for more variety of people and religions. All right, so in these colonies, you have something starting to change. Now, look at this map here at the bottom. You see the blue area was really claimed by France. We've already seen the pink area there is claimed by Great Britain. That's where the original 13 colonies were. But the blue area is really what France has. The British and the French fought over this blue area, which is the Ohio River Valley. That's the land west of the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains ran at the western edge of these colonies. So during this war, oftentimes called the Seven Years' War, but we'll generally see it as the French and Indian War, um, the British won this land, gaining all the land in the Midwest. All that area that once was blue essentially becomes pink. It's now owned by the British after they win this war. So the British borrowed lots of money to fund this war, which is often the case. Wars cost money. They borrowed this money. So after the war, yes, they won the war. Yes, they claimed the land now. Yes, the French said, okay, it's yours. But the British were deeply in debt. When the war ended, King George III issued the Proclamation of 1763. This proclamation states that no colonists in the pink area there could go west of the Appalachian Mountains, basically all the blue area. They said, don't go past this area. We don't want you even going into this area. So even though they gained the land, the colonists didn't, weren't allowed access to it. Unfortunately, many colonists already had some homes and land in that area. So, of course, they were not upset. They were very upset by this, and it didn't sit well with the colonists. So not only did the Proclamation of 1763 upset colonists who wanted to continue moving west, but it infuriated, as I said, those who already were living there. 
because they were forced now to move east of the line. Just a, a quick reason why King George issued this proclamation was basically he was saying, you can't go past this line because you, the colonists, were oftentimes at war and were fighting with the Native Americans. And he didn't want to send more troops out there to defend these colonists because it was costing him money. In order to pay back war debts, the British began to tax the colonists. Again, the British won the French Indian War, but it cost them money. So they figured to gain this money back, we will tax the colonists. So it started with the Sugar Act in 1764. Then you have the Stamp Act, which is not a tax on stamps, by the way. It's a stamp onto paper products. It was a tax on all paper products, and they would stamp it. Um, and so this tax on paper products and sugar, this began to upset the colonists because they were used to salutary neglect, right? They were used to being neglected. Leave us alone. Don't bother us with taxes. So the colonial boy, the colonists decide to start boycotting, which means we're not going to purchase, we're not going to buy any of these products. Um, and so they started boycotting things, like anything that the British were taxing. Well, as these protests continued, the British government finally started pulling back on taxes, but then more taxes came. There was just a back and forth of taxes and kind of this battle. This was the beginning process of uniting the colonists against the British. There's more taxes. We're not going to go deeply into those. But what we see is that these taxes is what really started bringing the colonists together. And we see that in modern day society, too. When people start to feel oppressed by a government or feel mistreated by a larger force, that kind of unites and brings people together. I told you these different colonists were all unique and separate and individual. I'm a Virginian. I'm a Georgian. I'm a Connecticut. I don't know how you say that. Sorry, people in Connecticut. Um, whatever colony you're from, you were uniquely individual. But now the same British government is taxing all of you and you all feel unfairly treated. This finally began to unite the colonists. So the Stamp Act was repealed. So that's the British government saying, we're pulling that back. We're no longer going to tax you. Okay, you're boycotting. We'll stop. It's hurting us more than it's helping us. In 1766, so due to colonial boycotts, as I said, and then more taxes continued to come. The Townsend Acts were a series of taxes on glass, lead, paints, paper, and tea. Okay, there was another tea act, and we're not going to get all into that, but the point is, is that there was more and more taxes coming on more and more things. This caused boycotts, riots, united resistance, and general hatred towards the British at this point. Um, during this time, you have the Boston Massacre. Five colonists who were protesting and really more like rioting against the British soldiers who were now being shipped over more and more to keep down these boycotts, to oh, stop these riots. They were rioting against these British soldiers. A shot was fired. We don't we, we don't know exactly what happened, but we know the British shot and killed five colonists. This news spread throughout the colonies, thanks to Paul Revere, who did a nice little etch and drawing and sent it in publications throughout the colonies. colonies. And of course, this united the colonists. They're killing our fellow colonists here. This has to be the last straw. So this Brit Boston Massacre began to unite the colonists even more. So as these tensions ran high after the Boston Massacre... Well, throughout the colonies, there was a sense, as I said, of unification. Look at that image at the top right that we see printed during this time period. Um, these colonists felt mistreated, and again, their hatred began to unite them towards, against the British government. In this time, a group is formed, essentially in Boston. It's called the Sons of Liberty. Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Patrick Henry, and Paul Revere, amongst others, were all members of this group. This group were joining to fight against these taxes and the more and more oppressive British rule in the colonies. So this group led what was what soon became known as the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party were the Sons of Liberty who dressed up as Indians so that they wouldn't get caught, so they could blame it on other people. In fact, for many years, they remained silent about who was actually a participant in this Tea Party because they didn't want to get killed for it. Um, they weren't. They were proud of it, but they probably weren't telling the world who was doing it. Everyone knew, generally speaking, who did it. But you have the Boston Tea Party. They jump on a ship in the Boston Harbor, and they dump tea into the Boston Harbor in protest of taxes on tea. Um, and in fact, more so in protest of taxes that are being finally legislated, or not legislated, but finally enforced against tea. So as they dump the tea into the harbor, 
Then this really upsets the British government, of course. You're dumping merchandise into the harbor. You are, you're really, really taking it too far now. So this is when the British government decides to enact what's called the Coercive Act. The Coercive Acts were rules and regulations placed on Massachusetts colonists and other colonies too, I believe, but on Massachusetts colonists as punishment for this Boston Tea Party. So the Boston Tea Party led to the Coercive Acts. And the coerce, coercive, by the way, just means I'm going to force you to do something. If you're coerced, you're forced. So the forceful acts, okay? These acts included closing Boston Harbor, limiting town meetings, which is how the colonies started. Remember, that's their self-government, having town meetings. And so they said, nope, no more of that. You can't use the harbor, which, again, shipping, they can't participate in that. This really hurts all of them. Making administers immune to criminal punishment. So that just means that the British rulers now in the colonies couldn't be punished by the colonists. And the Quartering Act. This meant that the British troops who are now coming in droves to Boston and the, the surrounding areas now are can forcibly live inside the homes of the colonists. You can imagine how upset this made them. The colonists actually called the Coercive Acts the Intolerable Acts, and that's what they're most well known for or known as today is the intolerable acts. These are intolerable. And I've joked with a lot of my students, if you see that in the middle of the test, you know, that pound your fist on the, the, the table, this is intolerable. Now don't do that during the test, but at least think of me when you see it. These acts are intolerable. We cannot take these. The colonists felt like this is unfair, cruel, and unusual punishment. Um, so this is when the first Continental Congress convened. The first, they decided all these, and all this is, is representatives from across the colonies came together and met and started to decide, what are we going to do about this? So what did they decide? Essentially, they just said, we need to start forming separate militias, which are little small town militaries, basically. Just men who, would, who were called minute men, who were ready in one minute is the, the thought, in all these farming communities and villages and cities and towns across the colonies. So again, you can see that the more the British punish intolerable acts, the more the colonies began to unite. Their cry was no taxation without representation, which is their way of saying you're taxing us, but we don't have a vote or a say in it. And that's not fair. Yes, we can vote in our own little governments, but the government that's taxing us is the British government and parliament. And so they didn't like that. It didn't seem fair. So now you have the beginning of a war, and this is how it starts. The British troops leave Boston late one night to confiscate militia arms, weapons, in a nearby town called Concord. Well, Paul Revere, if you remember his name before, he's the one who spread the Boston Massacre message across the colonies. He's a very involved Bostonian. He's part of the Sons of Liberty. He rides ahead in the middle of the night, warning other Minutemen in these communities along the way, all the way to Concord. He tells them, the British soldiers are coming. The Redcoats are coming. The British regular troops, they're coming. And so when the, the British troops get or almost get to Concord, the colonists are ready for them. And this happens at first in the town of Lexington, which is on the way to Concord. They meet a resistance force of militia military, which are these colonists, right, in Lexington. And we don't know who fired the first shot, but it began a skirmish there. The British quickly handled the colonists and moved on to Concord, but it's called the shot heard round the world, okay? And so they moved on to Concord, but by the time they get to Concord, no weapons are there because the colonists have moved them all. So the British have to march back to Boston, many of them getting shot and killed along the way. And this is what essentially starts this war. So within weeks of this battle, you have the Second Continental Congress, which is mostly the same colonial representatives as the First Continental Congress. They meet up once again. This has become serious. They meet in Philadelphia, and beginning on May 10th, 1775, we can see it's just a few weeks after this first battle. And they continue from this point forward to manage the war effort and eventually, within a year or so, they declare independence. Let's talk about that. So before we get there, George Washington at the Second Continental Congress, um, he was selected by this Congress to become the first general and commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. And that's June 14, 1775. Before that, they're all a bunch of groups of militias. 
And he comes in and he starts to command them and they form together as one army. Before Washington, there really wasn't any unification, as I said. There were just different militias from different colonies and different towns and communities. No leaders. It was very chaotic. This didn't change immediately, but eventually his leadership fortified these men into a more unified fighting force, right? So fighting for independence. There's a few battles we'll talk about. We're not going to talk about every one, but the Battle of Bunker Hill, it was a British victory, technically, and it was near and right currently in the city of Boston, but it was near Boston. Um, but the British had a great struggle and lost many, many men to finally overtake this hill. And what it did is it proved to them and to the Americans that, wow, these Americans are going to fight hard and fight strong. And even though they're not much of a formulated army, we might have a long war on our hands. Um, so July 4th, 1776, this is the date that should, should be of all dates in just singed into your brain. The Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress, technically, they ratify, which means just sign into law. They, they choose or sign it into being. They choose to agree on it. They ratify the Declaration of Independence. And who is it written by? I hope you know this one. You will if you don't. It's Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a very young man, and he wrote this Declaration of Independence. They agreed on it. They finally signed it on July 4th, 1776. It was essentially, this is what it was. It was a document written to explain to England and to the rest of the world why the Americans were choosing to leave British rule and become an independent nation. Oh, hold on, let me get to our right slide here. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Declaration of Independence in just a second, but let's, let's talk about some more of the battles here. The Battle of Trenton was a small but significant victory for George Washington and the Continental Army as they defeated and captured nearly 1,500 British troops. This is at the river. You see the picture there. That's him crossing the Delaware River in the middle of night on Christmas night, by the way, in the dark of night, snuck over there. Brilliant military tactic here. And it really helped um, really the morale of these troops early in a war that they weren't winning at this point. And I say they're British troops, technically they're Hessians, which are hired, um, they're hired guns basically from the area of modern day, like in the area of Germany. The British government actually hired other people to come um, and fight the war for them, um, though there were British troops as well at other places. So this is one of the battles that we've seen multiple times on a test. This is called the Battle of Saratoga which this is where it was technically two battles over a couple weeks, but the Americans defeated and captured a massive British army. This was considered a turning point in the war because news of this American victory caused the French to want to support the Americans in fighting the British. I remember it this way, Saratoga. It sounds like a foreign word, doesn't it? Well, hopefully you can remember that. Wow, that's really foreign sounding, Saratoga. Well, that is when the foreign country of France decided to help us because, whoa, these Americans might just have a chance at winning this war. And if they do, we want to be a part of it because we don't like the British either. All right, so then we have Valley Forge. It was really, this is not a battle, by the way. Valley Forge is a location in Pennsylvania that Washington and his troops, they, they really just, just camped down there in the winter. Um, and it was miserably, brutally cold, and many, many men died. It was a challenging and fortifying time for America as they resolved to endure and overcome. That's what Valley Forge is, is most famous for. It was a very difficult winter. A lot of men, you can see in this picture, some of them don't really have full pants. Some of them are barefoot walking in the snow, and they were bloodied and freezing to death and starving. And these men, thanks to George Washington, somehow stuck together, managed to survive this winter at Valley Forge and continue on. Then you have the Battle of Yorktown. This is the most significant battle of the war, if for no other reason than it was the last than it was the last battle. This is the final victory over the British forces, capturing the renowned British general Cornwallis and his thousands of men. This was where the French and the Americans joined forces and surrounded and defeated the British at Yorktown. I remember it this way. It starts with a Y, which is almost the last letter of the alphabet. It's almost the exact complete last battle of the war, essentially. So it's the last one that we need to know of. Treaty of Paris, 1783. So shortly thereafter, the British signed the treaty, which they agree and say, okay, America, United States, you are fully independent. We agree. We are no longer going to rule over you. 
So let's talk about, let's go backtrack a little bit to this Declaration of Independence. I told you that's where we declared our independence, but we that was 1776. The Treaty of Paris wasn't until 1783, so we didn't really fully gain recognition as independent until then. But we declared our independence on July 4th, 1776. Thomas Jefferson is the author. It's worth noting that the men who signed this, um, this famous, this, this document, like the very first signature, we've seen this on the test before, John Hancock, he's the first signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was the president of this Continental Congress at the time. So he signs it, big bold letters, John Hancock. These men were potentially signing their lives away because they were admitting to the king and the rest of the world, hey, we're rebellious against you. So if they would not have won that war, all the signatures on this declaration probably would have been hunted down and those men would have been executed for treason. So let's read a little bit of this declaration. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. But when a long train of abuses, usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is the right, it is truly their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferings of these colonies. This is Thomas Jefferson saying, look, all men are created equal. We were created with these unalienable, which means rights that cannot be removed. And these rights are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And governments are supposed to be here to protect those rights. And when a government doesn't protect those rights, it's the right of that people to alter or throw off or abolish that government. And what he's saying is this is the government that is completely restricting these rights. So it's our it's our duty to overthrow this government. That's what the declaration said. So here is some of the things that he was griping about, okay? These are the things that these Americans were saying. This is what this king did to us. This is why we're overthrowing this government. And this is the Birch shorthand version of what he wrote, okay? I'm going to read these rather quickly. To prove, this is his sentence, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. That's Thomas Jefferson saying, to prove that we have been treated unfairly, let me tell you what the king did. And again, this is my, this is Mr. Birch's version of the grievances, the things that were done unfairly to the colonists. The king refused to agree to the right laws, forbidden governors from performing the right laws, refused to let people be represented, called legislatures together in strange times and places, making it nearly impossible for people to attend, ended legislatures for opposing him, disallowed others to be elected, discouraged migrants to the colonies, obstructed justice, made judges dependent on him alone, sent officers to harass, kept standing armies, made military independent of civil power, judged colonists according to foreign laws, quartered armies, protected his troops from murder charges by mock trials, cut off trade from the rest of the world, taxes without consent of the people, deprived, deprived the people of trial by jury, transporting us abroad, so to England, for trials of pretended offenses, abolishing English laws, removing charters and abolishing our laws, suspending our legislatures, waging war against us, plundered, ravaged, burnt, destroyed us, bringing large armies of mercenaries, that's like the Hessians, to kill us, reign in terror and tyranny, unlike any time in history, captured us, forcing us to fight against ourselves. He tried to get the Indians to savagely kill us. We've humbly petitioned, but he has refused because he's a tyrant. That's a lot of things to gripe about, I would say. So now that we have, we're working on becoming an independent nation, we're fighting this war, they had to form a government. Well, the Articles of Confederation was the first written constitution of the United States. It was ratified on March 1st, 1781, so this is before we actually finally won the war. But nonetheless, 
it was our new government, okay? It was the Articles of Confederation. We're the United States government, but the Articles of Confederation are our first form of this U.S. government. The states remained sovereign and independent. States had the power, but the federal government was very, very weak. We had a weak federal government. Each state had one congressional vote, regardless of size. Congress was given authority to make treaties and alliances, maintained armed forces, and coin money, though it took at least nine of 13 states in order to pass a decision. That's a big majority. That's hard to do. But the federal government couldn't levy taxes, couldn't regulate commerce, had no judicial system, and no president. So we think of our government today as having three branches. That government only had one branch. It was So it's not even a branch. It was the legislative body. So it was a very weak central government. That's what you need to take away from the Articles of Confederation. Strong state governments, weak federal government, or otherwise known as central government. All right, after the failures of the Articles of Confederation, and it did fail, it did not work very well, representatives from the state convened for the Constitutional Convention to write a new constitution for the country. This is in 1787. James Madison wrote the original document. It was originally called the Virginia Plan, and they morphed it and rewrote it into this new con U.S. Constitution. This new Constitution created a bicameral legislature with two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. So of among other things that it did, we had a legislature that was split in two. Two parts, think of like a bicycle, two wheels, bicameral. You have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. We'll talk more about that here shortly. So during this... Constitutional Convention, you have the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and they were at a standoff on their disagreeing views of the government. Federalists wanted a stronger national government. They ratified the Constitution to help manage the country's debt and to promote a strong federal government. Some of these men included Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, John Adams. The Anti-Federalists, however, they opposed a strong federal government. Think about it, Anti-Federalist against the federal government. They preferred more state rights and more individual rights and power. These men included men like Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, um, which Jefferson wasn't actually there at the time, by the way, but you have Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, and George Mason. Those are the men that we see most often um, with this group. Um, Jefferson, maybe not so much because he wasn't even actually at the Constitutional Convention, but these people were, well, they were against a strong federal government. They wanted things like a Bill of Rights for the people and less federal power. So the Anti-Federalists weren't pleased with much of the Constitution because, again, it gave more power to the federal government. Um, a compromise was reached, <clears throat> the Great Compromise, right? And this compromise, um, well, we'll talk about that in a second, but there were many compromises, but one of the things they agreed to was the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. They were ratified and called the Bill of Rights. The first 10 amendments was saying that we're going to give explicit or stated rights to the American people, not just talk about how the federal government works. We're going to give rights to the people. So here, now we're getting to the Great Compromise. Small states felt they wouldn't be represented fairly in Congress, while large states didn't want to be up underrepresented. The Connecticut Compromise became known as the Great Compromise, it allowed for equal representation in the Senate. So in the Senate, each state has two representatives, no matter if you're big or small. And then representatives based on population in the House of Representatives. So in the House, again, a bicameral legislature or Congress, you have the Senate. Every state is represented equally with two representatives. In the House of Representatives, every state is has the number of representatives based on their population. So you have more people representing a bigger state and less people representing a smaller state. That was a great compromise. Let's talk about this governmental structure. Some of this we've already mentioned, but the government was framed with three branches that share power and balance each other in the federal government. The judicial branch, that is the federal judges. The Supreme Court is the chief of these, and they, are, they uphold the law and decide matters of legality, right? That's the judicial branch. That did not exist in the Articles of Confederation. This only exists in the new U.S. Constitution. Then you have the executive branch. Again, did not exist in the Articles, but does now exist in the Constitution. There was no president until this point. The executive branch is the president and his appointed cabinet members and the vice president. That's what makes up this branch, okay? Then the last branch is legislative branch, or you could say the first branch because they're the ones who were actually still there with the Articles of Confederation. Legislative branch is the Congress, the representatives of each state in this bicameral chambers, again, the Senate and the House. 
Um, and one thing I don't have written here, but it's important to note that these three branches of government, they check and they balance each other. That's the intention of these checks and balances of the federal government. Okay, the Bill of Rights. Let's go through these briefly. This is the first 10 amendments or alterations or additions to the Constitution. U.S. citizens, this is the First Amendment, U.S. citizens have freedom of religion, of speech, of press, assembly, and petition. So a lot of freedoms in the first one. The second one, U.S. citizens have the right to keep and bear arms, a.k.a. guns, right? Number three, government may not force U.S. citizens to shelter soldiers in their homes. We didn't like the Quartering Act, so we're going to make sure that can't happen again. Number four, U.S. citizens are protected from unreasonable search of a person's property. Number five, the government may not force U.S. citizens to testify against themselves. We hear that on TV shows a lot today. I plead the fifth. The Fifth Amendment means I'm not going to testify against myself in a court of law. Number six, U.S. citizens have the right to a fair and speedy trial. Number seven, number seven U.S. citizens have the right to a trial by jury. Number eight, U.S. citizens are protected from cruel and unusual punishment. Number nine, U.S. citizens may have rights that are not listed in the Constitution. Again, that goes back to the Anti-Federalists. They wanted to make sure that American citizens had rights and lots of them. And so they said, just because it doesn't say it in the Constitution, you may still have more rights. Number nine, powers not given to the federal government by the Constitution belong to the state or to the people. So nine and ten are very similar. They're very Anti-Federalist type of amendments here, as they all are, really. Okay, George Washington, he becomes the first president, right? Overwhelmingly wins the first presidency, um, but soon enough there's trouble. You have the Whiskey Rebellion. It was an uprising in western Pennsylvania against taxes, right? These farmers didn't like these taxes that this new federal government is imposing on them. It's very American. We just like to fight against taxes. It's what we do. Um, so these western Pennsylvanians, they didn't like that there's taxes imposed by this federal government because it hurt their personal business. So George Washington rides out on his horse, leading an army of, of men to put down this insurgency. He says, nope, you're going to pay taxes. You're an American. You have your representatives who get to make these votes, and you, you voted for these men, and they have made this decision, so you're going to have to pay taxes. And that's the Whiskey Rebellion. Washington stepped down from his presidency after only his second term in office. He probably could have won and continued to be president for the rest of his life. But he urged the country when he stepped down from the office, he said in his farewell address, he said two major things that we continue to see. He said, don't split into party politics. Don't have these different political parties with against each other because it's going to divide our country. And he said, also, don't make long-term alliances with foreign nations. As I've said before, sorry, Mr. Washington, we did both of those things very shortly after you left. All right, so during the Constitutional Convention, this is before Washington, or right before Washington becomes president, we have something called the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance was adopted by the Second Continental Congress, you see that image at the top right, um, as a way to govern. Remember I showed you all that land that we gained from Great Britain after the war, the land that used to be the Ohio River Valley? Well, we gain that land, but they're not actually states in our early country. They're just territories. The Northwest Ordinance set up a standard, a legal system to govern that land and to eventually allow those different territories to become states. That's what the Northwest Ordinance is. All right, moving forward, Thomas Jefferson. He becomes the third president. John Adams was the second president. So Thomas Jefferson becomes the third president, right? He oversaw the Louisiana Purchase, which is growing the country westward by about 828,000 square miles. You know, no big deal. Just that whole middle part of the country you see the arrow pointing to. He bought that from France for $15 million. Let's talk about this growth of the country. Manifest destiny. This is the idea of the U.S. gaining all the land from the East Coast, where we started, all the way to the West Coast. It becomes this inspirational idea in the hearts and minds of Americans, and you see it in politics, and you see it in the people of the country, that we are going to gain, own, acquire however we need to all of this land, from sea to shining sea. It will be our destiny, right? Remember that phrase there, manifest destiny. And, and this is actually manifest in the things that we do. We purchase Louisiana. Texas, after it gains its independence from Mexico, shortly thereafter joins the United States and U.S. gains Texas. And then, thanks to some president named James Polk, 
he decides to kind of start a war with Mexico, really. Um, at the Battle, Battle of Palo Alto, we, we go to war with Mexico. In a couple short years, we gain all of that land in orange or red that you see there. And that's called the Mexican Cession. And we keep growing westward, right? That's Manifest Destiny. All right. During this early part of the country, we come up with an idea called Monroe Doctrine. President James Monroe enacted this idea, and he said to the European nations, he said, no European country can come into the Western Hemisphere. You see that image at the top right? Stop right here at this line. The Western Hemisphere is essentially all of the Western part of the world, which is North, Central, and South America, right? No European power, no British, no Dutch, no Spanish, no Portuguese, no European powers can come into this part of the world, not just the U.S., but any other countries, and colonize or make it their own nations. And that was the U.S. kind of putting their foot down. All right, let's talk about the Mexican War and Mexican Cession. I already mentioned this earlier, but after Texas gained its independence from Mexico, they soon joined the United States. This didn't sit well with Mexico because Mexico never really fully embraced the idea that Texas was independent in the first place. So Texas was its own country for uh, about 10 years. It didn't work out so well. We like to think it did as Texans, but it just didn't. So then President James K. Polk, after Texas becomes part of the United States, his, he was a very much manifest destiny president. Polk was manifest destiny. Remember that. His attitude of gaining the whole country, well, it it's made clear in this war because he sent troops led by Zachary Taylor, uh, who ended up becoming president later because of his fame in this war, he sent troops down there to the edge of Mexico and Texas border near near New Mexico there. And he sent troops down there and really instigated a battle with Mexico. We, as the United States, we won that war quite handily going all the way into Mexican territory until they finally gave up. And it's called the Mexican Cession. They gave us the land that you see in that light yellow color. That's all the land they gave us, a ton of land. California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and part of Wyoming even. Um, so the war with Mexico began at the Battle of Palo Alto and ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Okay, so let's talk about some craziness that starts to take place. The 49ers and the California Gold Rush. So right after we gained California, the United States said, California is ours. Mexico said, fine, you can have it. Right after that, conveniently enough, in 1849, gold is discovered in California, and it goes to a mad leads to a mad rush of Americans rushing out to California to try to get rich. Not only Americans, but you even have um, Chinese immigrants coming all the way across the Pacific from China trying to get to California to get rich with this gold. The fast growth of California and the Oregon Territory, which we acquired from Great Britain. Um, let's I can see if we can take you back there real quick. That's, you see the Oregon Territory, the map at the bottom right in the upper left is that green. That's Oregon Territory. With that land that we acquired, um, populations um, begin to stream out westward, and eventually the Transcontinental Railroad is built. That's the first railroad that actually connects the east all the way to the west. I already told you many Chinese immigrants streamed into California seeking riches of gold, but oftentimes a lot of them ended up working on railroads. They faced Intense nativism, which is the idea that Americans often had, saying that we are, this is our land, you're an immigrant. And it was a very racist, um, resistant attitude towards these people. In the 1800s, and I apologize, I think this is a little cut off. In the 1800s, thousands of German and Irish immigrants um, began to come into our country as well. The Irish often came because of a potato famine. There's about 2 million or so of those throughout the 1800s. The Germans migrated oftentimes because of political issues and warring in their own area of Europe, but they migrated into the eastern and northern states, many working in factories and living in cities due to industrialization. Oftentimes the Germans were moving into the Midwest, which by the way is actually east of northeast of Texas, what we call the Midwest, but they were moving there sometimes for farming, um, oftentimes for farming in small communities. But the Irish oftentimes ended up in cities working in factories. Okay, um, we talked about the madness um, beginning last time. Let's talk about a little bit more madness. So the U.S. was growing and, and industry was taking place, right? So the growing nation was building roads and canals and telegraph lines and railroads. One of the first things was the National Road. It was built between 1811 and 1837. It covered about 620 miles from Maryland to Illinois. 
Um, the Erie Canal was built from Lake Erie, which is one of the Great Lakes up there in the north of the Midwest area. And it went from Lake Erie to the Hudson River in New York. And it greatly expanded the city of New York because they could transport goods there, as I told you earlier, very quickly through these canals. By the way, if you don't know, a canal is basically, uh, it's a man-made river. You carve and through land, you cut down trees, you bulldoze things, and you blow up mountains. You do whatever you take to carve to where this water can flow. All right, so now you have the Missouri Compromise. It was the first of many negotiations regarding new states entering the Union and the slavery problem. Missouri allowed it was allowed to enter the, con the country as a slave state, and the compromise was, well, if Missouri comes in as a slave state, then the state of Maine will enter as a free state. So that was part of the compromise. The other part of the compromise was that there was an imaginary line. You see the blue circle of uh, Missouri in the center of your map at the bottom. Maine is on the in the northeast corner. Missouri's in the center. You see that line, and then there's that little box that says Missouri Compromise Line. That's 36 degrees, um, 3630 degree of latitude there. So they said from that line over in that whole area that at the time was the rest of what America was. The land north of that will be free. The land south of that will be slave. That was the Missouri Compromise. Speaking of slavery, let's talk about the origins of slavery in our country. Uh, it really started with indentured servitude, which was typically a seven-year service. One was required to pay off debts, followed by gaining of, of freedom. So you could pay your debts by working for seven years, and then you had the chance to become free if you lived that long, which didn't always happen. And with, this was practiced for the first few decades of colonial America, but soon slavery was legalized and transatlantic slave trade was born. This was the buying, selling, and shipping of slaves from Africa to the Americas. Slavery was more common in the South because there were more cash crop farms. Uh, plantations is what they're usually known as. They were mostly tobacco, rice, and indigo, and then eventually, like I said before, eventually it became cotton was the king. These were vast lands, and, they, and, and the need for cheap labor to harvest these crops led these early colonists to begin to participate in this vile slave trade, right? The North had more merchants and shipping and smaller farms and uh, trading, and thus their need for cheap labor was a little bit different, and there was a lot less slavery in the North. Slavery eventually was outlawed in most of the Northern states, not all, um, and but it continued to grow in the Southern states as cotton became a more profitable crop. With the invention of the cotton gin, slavery became ex exponentially more profitable in the South and drove in industry. So Eli Whitney, he invented the cotton gin. Before the cotton gin was invented, it took a slave. They could get about a pound, pound of cotton produced and ready in a day. They had to pull all these tiny seeds out of the cotton. That's what took so long. They could, they could harvest it from the field, but they had to get all these seeds out of it. That took forever. And the cotton gin eliminated that process. The slaves still picked the cotton, but the cotton gin removed those seeds, and the production of cotton went up exponentially. So what this did is it caused the Southerners to want and desire more slaves to pick more cotton because they could get it ready quicker. Um, Three-fifths compromise. This was a decision in 1787, so this is um, at the formation of our country in the Constitutional Convention. The three-fifths compromise, they decided to count slaves in the Southern slaveholding states um, as three-fifths of a person towards counting the state population. So this is a difficult issue to talk about. It's obviously really disturbing and seems very unfair, and it was. Slavery is, is just a, it's something that you can't fix and make right as long as it's in existence. But this three-fifths compromise established that slaveholding populations wouldn't count quite as much, or slave populations, as white populations. This gave some power to slaveholding states, but not infinite power. If they would have counted each slave as one whole person, Instead of three-fifths of a person, their population numbers would have risen based on that count, and they would have had more representatives in the House of Representatives. Okay, let's talk about, and you might want to write this down. I think it's on your notes, though. It's the Scott v. Sanford case. Dred Scott, this is how I tell you to remember it, it's dreadful to be Dred Scott. Dred Scott was a former slave, or technically a current slave, who tried to sue for his rightful freedom. Um, long story short, he, he was in a situation where legally he should have been free at this point where he was currently living. Um, he tried to sue the federal government for his, his rightful freedom. 
Well, the Supreme Court, led by probably the worst Supreme Court judge we maybe have ever had, Roger Taney, he said that a black man was property and thus not a U.S. citizen. If you're not a U.S. citizen, you cannot sue the U.S. government and you don't have any right to life or any liberties for that matter because you're only property of another citizen. You're not yourself a person or citizen. Obviously, like I told you, it was a dreadful case, the Scott versus Sanford State case. Dred Scott did not win that case. Roger Taney kind of ruined some lives there. All right, stick with me. We've got two slides left, and when then we're done, I think. So abolitionists, slavery. Abolitionists were those who believed slavery was wrong and sought to end it. They wanted to abolish slavery. Kind of easy to remember that name, I hope. Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was a white woman who wrote the fictional best-selling book called Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852. This is before the Civil War, but what this did is it really sparked a lot of passion in the abolitionists. It showed, it was a fictional story, but it really did show a lot of the darker sides of slavery, which all of slavery is a darker side. It's a terrible thing, of course. But the Northerners, who weren't really as exposed to slavery, maybe didn't really know how bad it was until books like hers came out that really told a true heartfelt story that really pulled at the heartstrings of a lot of people. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. So the Quakers, they were a religious group that was around for, for decades before the, the Civil War, but they opposed slavery, they were abolitionists, and they often helped with abolitionist movements, including the Underground Railroad, which wasn't a railroad technically, and it wasn't underground technically. It was a network of abolitionists, people who wanted to abolish slavery, who helped people like Harriet Tubman and others rescue slaves to northern free states. So let's make it clear. The Underground Railroad was basically a passage or journey, um, and it was a way to get slaves from the south up to the northern free states. Harriet Tubman often called the, um, oh, it just slipped my mind, the, uh, the, what is it called, the person who leads a, a train, the conductor of the Underground Railroad. And Harriet Tubman was herself a former slave and went back into slave states, risking her own life many, many times to deliver many slaves to freedom. All right, that's the Underground Railroad and the Quakers. All right, some other freedom fighters. John Brown, he was an abolitionist to the extreme who felt action was more necessary than words. Um, he said, uh, or in regards to freeing slaves, right? He was an action man. He uh, some, some questionable tactics he used, but let's talk about it. He was, the mo he was most infamous for his raid on Harper's Ferry, which was a United States military outpost where they kept um, weapons, right? So he raided this with a group of men hoping to incite a ra and rally slaves to a revolution. It didn't really work. Um, Amer it didn't work at all. American soldiers um, ended up catching them. He didn't get all the slaves he expected to join his force, and many of them were killed, and he was ended up tried and killed himself. Um, another freedom fighter was Nat Turner. He was a slave who escaped and led a rebellion in 1831 in which he and other escaped slaves free, um, freed other slaves. They went along to different plantations and they killed plantation owners, including men, women, and children. And they went around killing and trying to free other slaves. Um, he was eventually captured and he was executed as well. Um, Abraham Lincoln. So Nat Turner was a former slave who tried to leave a rebellion. John Brown was a white abolitionist. He actually fought in bloody Kansas, too. Um, we'll, I think we'll talk more about that in the next video series, but he was an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln, he issued the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation. That was during the war, right after the Battle of Antietam, and he said that all slaves in the Confederate states are now free. So he proclaimed, emancipation just means free from slavery, basically. He said, I'm going to emancipate, I'm going to free all of you slaves in the southern states, in the Confederate states. But it really wasn't until the 13th Amendment, after the war was over, that slaves in all U.S. states were officially freed. Whew, I know that was a lot. I appreciate you watching the whole video. You've got one more of these to watch. And then that's the last of the video series. You can continue studying your packet. You can go back and watch more videos if you feel you need to. Obviously, that will never hurt. But I appreciate your time. And that's it for part one of the cram session for the 7-Minute Mastery Series. Thanks, guys.